Hello everyone, thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and this video is part one of a two-part video on close reading some elements of A Doll's House, talking about how to apply the lessons of close reading that we do, uh, that we did in reading poetry to dramatic texts as well. So let's begin with a review of the concept of close reading, which we haven't talked about extensively since we began working with poetry. Uh, Close reading is, it's an analytical process. Your attention is focused on the details of the text in front of you. The features, the formal features, how it's put together, the words on the page, all that sort of thing. Uh, it's also, it's constructive. You're connecting the elements. You're trying to understand how the different details that you're looking at work together and you're making connections between them. And it's also creative. It's open to multiple possibilities of meaning, and it's not restricted to the idea of some um, exclusive single meaning that is the correct or proper interpretation of the text. Close reading as a process, of course, it's obviously suited to poetry because poetry has many complex formal features. Poetry is very dense in this way, um, and it relies on these formal features to a much larger extent than other forms of literature. Uh, and fiction and drama, because they're often closer to everyday speech, it's easy to overlook the poetry of the, the language, so to speak. It's easy to overlook how it, too, functions in the same way that poetry does, uh, how the details function to help us create, uh, understanding, generate new meanings. So in this video, we're going to be looking at dramatic prose uh, and focusing on how to close read it in the same way that we might read poetry, taking account of the differences that this isn't structured as poetry. Prose writing, that is standard writing, the writing that we use that's not structured as verse with a metrical and rhythmic, um, explicit metrical and rhythmic uh, organization, it uses the same techniques as poetry, metaphor, imagery, all that sort of thing, tone, uh, if less obviously. And so we're going to be looking at the style, the syntax, the imagery, all these sorts of things that are part of the language of dramatic pro prose, just as they are for poetry, uh, and see how they are carefully crafted to express the theme, the character, um, just as poetry does. And we're going to use individual moments. We're looking at individual moments within a much larger text uh, as a starting point for large scale interpretations. Just as with poetry, you can really start with any one moment or image and work outwards to understand the whole. Here we're going to be looking at individual lines, sentences stated by the characters and uh, examining how they unfold into complex meanings that can uh, help us to understand the play as a whole. So some of the things that we're going to be looking at, uh, we are going to be paying attention to the style of writing and the grammar, the style of speech. So that's the syntax, the order of the words or grammatical units that make up the sentence, uh, the tense, that is, when is it taking place? Is, this, is, uh, is the verb a past tense, present tense, future? Is it conditional? Those sorts of things. Uh, looking at the diction, that is the word choice. What type of language is the speaker using? Are they using any imagery? What does this tell us about their character? And voice, that is their tone, their attitude, emotions that are expressed. What image of them uh, of themselves are they creating through their speech? And we're also going to be looking at the semantic content, that is the, the meaning of the words, uh, the literal meaning of what the people are saying, what the speakers are, are saying to each other, uh, but also figurative and rhetorical meanings, that is how what they're saying uh, resonates with the themes uh, and ideas that structure the play as a whole or that we can see throughout the play and rhetorical meanings that is how um, the speakers are using their language to persuade the other person to get something that they want from the other person and third we're going to be examining and thinking about the context of these statements in poetry the context is largely unspoken it's largely imagined a poem is often a moment a brief uh, glimpse into the life of the speaker uh, here we have much a much larger glimpse we have this whole play three act play so we will also be looking at the context that's given to us how this uh, these lines these moments that we're going to be looking at fit into the larger narrative, how they uh, express the speaker's actions and goals over the course of the play, and how they reflect or are shaped by the immediate situation, that is what's happening in the moment that the person is speaking them. I've chosen as the first example a line from Act One that Krogstad speaks to Nora, which is, the law doesn't ask about motives. 
And in this, the context is that he, this is their first conversation or the first major conversation where he reveals that he knows about her forging the, her father's signature on the loan application. And so he's threatening her, trying to persuade her to um, convince Torvald to let him stay at the bank or he will reveal the secret. And I've chosen a line that's uh, sort of intentionally chosen a line that's that's pretty mundane. That's not really striking in its imagery or language. It's not a very poetic line in and of itself. Uh, it's often more useful to start with a poetic line or, or certainly um, the more extravagant or interesting evocative statements that the characters make can be very uh, good starting points for interpretation. But I've intentionally chosen something very simple and straightforward because even with this, we can, we can generate a lot of ideas about the play and use it to build out our understanding of the characters and their motivations and how their actions uh, and motivations uh, work together with the dialogue. Let's begin by breaking down the syntax of the sentence. It's a very simple, basic sentence in terms of its grammatical structure. The law is the subject, that is the agent of the sentence, the actor, the thing that's doing the action. Uh, the action that's being performed, or in this case, not being performed, is ask, doesn't ask. So the law is the subject that is not asking. The law is the subject that doesn't ask. And the last part of the sentence about motives, that's the object of the verb ask. That's what takes the, takes the energy or takes the uh, asking. Uh, and so the law doesn't ask about motives. Very simple, straightforward subject, verb, direct object. So in that simple uh, and direct statement, again, subject, verb, uh, direct object, um, there's a very clear, obvious meaning. There's little chance for ambiguity or hidden meaning in the sentence structure. The words uh, are very simple, as we'll see, although they still convey a lot of meaning. But the structure itself is very straightforward, so it's not uh, it's not likely that the that the listener is going to misunderstand what they're talking about, who is doing what, uh, that sort of thing. They're, they're, the meaning is straightforward and clear. Now, let's consider each of these aspects, uh, parts of the sentence in turn. First, the law, the subject. So it's a noun, but it's an abstract noun. Law is a concept, not a thing. Um, it's an idea, not a physical object like a building or a car or a table. And we have the definite article the, the law, the law, not a law, not some laws, not uh, any law, the law. So the definite article indicates singularity, individuality. This is a single thing and also familiarity. We know what the law is. Um, it's it's a one thing and there's no other law to compete with it. But what is this law? If it's a concept, if it's not a thing, what is it that we're actually talking about? Well, it's really the idea of law. And that is the law as a collection of ideas, concepts, regulations, practices, institutions, human agents, etc. So even though the law is abstract, it's a concept, not a thing, it's immaterial rather than material. Uh, it operates through the physical, it operates through the material. And so finally, what we've got here is, is an example of personification. It's taking this odd idea, this uh, uh, non-human idea of the law and making it into uh, a subject, a human-like actor, because it's the law that asks or doesn't ask. He doesn't say lawyers and other people who work in courts of law don't ask. He says the law doesn't ask. So we're personifying this abstract thing, taking an idea and making it real. Let's look at the verb, doesn't ask. So it's present tense, the law doesn't ask. And that indicates it's an ongoing action. This is something the law does regularly. This is its characteristic behavior, not asking. And it's how the law has acted, how it acts now, how it will act. So there's sort of a permanence uh, a perenniality, a perpetuality suggested by using the present tense doesn't ask. Also, we're getting a negative verb. It's not, say, it's not saying what the law does. It's saying what the law does not do. And it's a contraction of does not, doesn't. And that's a minor thing, but it will be suggestive when we think in a moment about Krogstad's uh, intentions here and his purpose. And it's a transitive verb. That is, uh, it acts upon or it acts towards objects. It takes an object. 
you ask of something else. It's not a verb that reflects back on the agent that's doing it. So this personified idea of law doesn't ask, and that's how it's, that's what it characteristically uh, does, or doesn't do rather, it doesn't ask. What does it not ask? The law doesn't ask about motives. So this is the object of ask. This is what um, the law asks or doesn't ask about. This is where the energy or the action of ask uh, is directed on motives. So the law doesn't ask about motives. And this is a prepositional phrase. In fact, uh, omitted seems to be the word questions. The, the law doesn't ask questions about motives, but I'm gonna leave that aside in this, in this discussion. Uh, and it's a plural noun and also another abstract concept. Motives, again, are not material things. They're immaterial. Um, they're inner thoughts. So the law, which is an abstract concept, doesn't care, doesn't ask about motives, doesn't ask about the inner thoughts of the people who come before it. Let's take a moment here to ask ourselves what's missing from the sentence. The law doesn't ask about motives. The law doesn't ask whom about their motives, right? That is the indirect object. Where are the questions about motives, if that's what the law asks or doesn't ask, who are those questions being directed towards? So we don't know that whom, we don't know who's being asked or who's not being asked, that indirect object of where the law's questions are directed or not directed, or where the law's attention, the people who are the object of the law's questioning, that's left out of the statement. Let's ask ourselves why. Why is it that that's not in the statement that Krogstad makes? Well, the indirect object is omitted, I think, because it's unimportant. That is, the law doesn't care about motives and the law doesn't care about anyone's motives. So it could be anyone or everyone that is being asked, or rather, doesn't, it isn't being asked about their motives. The law speaks the same to all, whether they're rich, poor, male, female, old, young, doesn't matter. The law doesn't ask about motives, doesn't care who you are. The law doesn't ask anyone, or another way to say it, the law asks no one about their motives. So the, it's left out because it's unimportant, it's insignificant. And that, I think, suggests the insignificance of the individual before the law, that the law doesn't care about our individuality, that that's something that is erased in some sense before the law, at least according to Krogstad's, uh, at least that's what's suggested by Krogstad's idea here, his statement here. And so when he's talking about the law, what he's doing is he's stating a principle, a general truth. This is how the law operates. It doesn't ask about motives. He's not talking about how the law is going to behave towards you, Nora Helmer. He's not talking about how a specific court or judge will be uh, what they will ask. It's the law and the law acts the way it does. So it's a general truth. It's something that is a fact of the world, we might say. And so the law's concern, not with motives, thoughts, or abstract intentions, the law's concern is with concrete facts, with actions. So there's an echo there. He's stating a, a truth, and that's what the law's concerned with, not fuzzy, uh, uh, hard to define things like motivations or intentions, but with what's there, what are the facts. That's what the law concerns itself with. That's what Krogstad is giving her, a general truth, a law you might say. So the law is impartial. It's impersonal. With no concerns for the motivations or inner thoughts of the accused, suggesting that Nora is going to be judged not by her intentions, not by what she wanted to do, not by what she meant, not by the goodness in her heart, not by the love she might have had for her husband, but by what she's done, which is forged a signature. The very impartiality and impersonality of the law, that is what makes the law operate, because if the law was partial, it wouldn't be a good law. That's what makes it deadly to Nora, dangerous for her, because all she has as her defense is her individual experience, her inner self, her thoughts, her love, the motivations for her committing her crime. That's really all she has to justify her, but those are insignificant to the law. They have no meaning before the law. And so in a sense, Nora has no meaning before the law. There is no Nora. There's just 
whoever the law is passing its judgment on, and that is anyone and everyone the same. Let's think about Krogstad's voice here, that is his tone. How is he expressing himself? There's a casual tone. So when I talked about the contraction, again, it's minor, but a contraction sign uh, signals casualness. It's, uh, it's informal. He doesn't say the law does not ask. He says the law doesn't ask. So it's, he's uh, speaking quickly, his casual tone, and thinking about that what he's doing is he's threatening blackmail. He's trying to intimidate her in this moment. And at the same time, he's educating her about the real world. This is how things work. I don't know how things work in your little dollhouse fantasy world, Nora, but in the real world, this is how the law works. So he's invoking the law as a weapon, a weapon against Nora, a weapon in his goal of blackmailing her. And he doesn't say what the law will do. He d so there's an unknown danger here. What, how will the law react? She's left to fill in the blanks herself. Well, if the law doesn't care about my motives and only cares about what I've done, I've committed a crime according to the law, so I will be punished. So putting it together, putting all these different elements together, we see again, in the context, Krogstad wishes to intimidate Nora and bully her into doing his will. And the simple, direct, casual style, the mundane language, the clarity of the message, all this is part of that process of intimidation. So think about what does this communicate beyond or in addition to the words themselves? How is the style that Krogstad speaks, the casual style, the, the telling Nora difficult truths about the real world, the straightforward language that nonetheless carries uh, a great deal of weight behind it and the straightforwardness of the idea itself. What does that all communicate rhetorically speaking? How does this work in addition to the, the words themselves, the direct meaning, the idea that he's expressing? What is he communicating about his position, her position, their situation? How is he, how does this work as part of his ploy how is he attempting to use the, the nature of his speech? How does it fit into the goals that he's trying to accomplish, which is again, to get Nora to submit to his will and uh, uh, convince Torvald to keep Krogstad on. So in terms of his style, I think it, it communicates his strength, the confidence in his victory. He's casual. He's not, uh, he, he's, he can just say these things uh, casually and simply because he knows them to be true. He knows the facts, which she doesn't. So he has this knowledge that she doesn't. He has a leg up on her. He has a, a, a superior position, the high ground, so to speak, uh, if not the moral high ground, the legal high ground. He's clear and direct, so there's no mistaking her situation. He's telling her what he already knows, almost in effect doing her a favor by telling her the truth of her situation. And there's no hint of mercy or pity here. He's just saying, this is the fact. The fact of the matter is the law doesn't care about your motives. The fact of the matter is that means I have the upper hand. That means I have the strength in this situation. And so I don't need to worry. I can just be clear and direct. I can be straightforward. I can be casual and say what I mean without worrying about anything else. So the sentence structure is integral to the clarity and simplicity of the, me of the message. That is the form of his speech and his intentions are matched. They, they uh, uh, complement each other. He has a straightforward intention and he wants her to know it. So he structures his language straightforwardly. I mean, this is in some sense obvious, but it's about um, how the idea, the ideas that motivate the play and that are um, at work in this play, they permeate every level of the text, even to the, to the statements, the individual sentences and lines that the characters speak. So Krogstad speaks in such a way that not just the ideas, but the form of his speech communicates what's going on inside of him. Let's think about the law that Krogstad's talking about uh, in terms of the semantic content or meaning of his, of his statement. He's again telling her the law's disregard for motives or inner thoughts. That's the straightforward uh, idea that he's expressing to her. 
if we were to summarize it, he's saying the law is not concerned, legal courts and legal procedures are not concerned with anything beyond facts. And that, again, we see how Krogstad's intentions and his position uh, matches the thing that he's talking about. Again, so here the semantic content, the meaning of the statement is appropriate. It matches, it complements Krogstad's position. Like Krogstad, the law is concerned with facts, not emotions. He's concerned with the fact that Nora owes him money, the fact that Nora forged her signature, and the fact that Torvald's going to fire him. He doesn't care about Nora's uh, marriage. He doesn't care if Torvald gets upset. He doesn't care about causing them suffering. He cares about the facts which give him authority, which give him power. So again, the structure of the sentence matches Krogstad's personality and his mood, his intentions, and the semantic content, the meaning of his statement matches, uh, communicates something about him in addition to the idea itself. Notice how uh, in that absence, leaving out the whom, the law doesn't ask, Krogstad doesn't say the law will not ask you, Nora Helmer, about your motives. So he doesn't name her or directly address her in this statement. And that again echoes the idea that the law is not going to name her. The law is not going to care who she is. The law is not going to care about her motives. So Krogstad's simple statement of truth that is true no matter whom he's saying it to, it's going to be true if he says it to Nora, to Torvald, to anyone else. It's the truth. Doesn't matter who it's spoken to. Just how, just like the law doesn't care who is before it. It doesn't care what their motivations are. It just administers itself. It ministers its judgments. So before both of them, Nora is unnamed. She loses her individual identity and she becomes merely uh, the record of what she's done. And so in this moment, we see that uh, Krogstad is passing judgment on Nora, or rather warning her about the judgment to come. Nora's future is in question. She can't predict what either the law or Krogstad will do. Will Krogstad pass a verdict on her, pass a judgment on her, uh, and punish her by informing Torvald? Will the law condemn her, convict her? Will Torvald convict her and condemn her? All she knows is that what she intended, no one's going to care about. Krogstad doesn't care about it. The law doesn't care about it. And of course, her greatest worry is that Torvald won't care about her, uh, her intentions. That, Krog that Torvald, too, will only care about what she's done, not what she wanted to do. And let's now talk for a minute just about how we might experiment with the style. Uh, could we rewrite this sentence? Can we imagine if it was stated, if it was written in a very different style, uh, would it still be effective or how would it be different in the play? How would the moment be different? What different ideas would it give us? Um, so the statement as it's written, uh, we might say we could describe it as impersonal, simple, clear, unambiguous. So as an experiment, let's see what happens if we rewrite it as a more personal statement, more ambiguous, complex structure and indirect in its message. So I've written this little uh, uh, sample here. Ah, simple Mrs. Helmer, perhaps you think your wifely devotion will sway the hearts of our city's men of justice. I have never known our courts to consider the frivolities of a woman's heart as reliable evidence. They will only care about what you have done, Mrs. Helmer, the bare brutal truth of your crimes. So in this, what I've done is I've changed the impersonal law to human men, the men of justice of the city. Uh, and I've made the address direct to Nora. He's talking directly to her and he's saying that the court, these men of justice will be talking directly to her. So the threat is directed spe specifically at her, not just about what the law does in general. And it states what the law will do, that the law is going to be con concerned about what you've done, your crimes, the truth. And the structure is more complicated, and so we still get the threat, but there's a more complicated path to it. Ah, perhaps you think this. I've never known that to happen. This is what's going to happen. So it, he meanders a little bit in, in this version that I've re rewritten uh, to get to the threat in a more complex way. And he also speculates about her inner thoughts and emotions 
in a way that he didn't in the uh, original version, in the actual version, um, and in a way that the law, he says, doesn't. So he's talking about her inner thoughts, uh, which he says the law will not do. So we might ask, is this less effective? Is it more effective? Or is it just different? I'm not trying to compare myself to Ibsen uh, as a writer or to the English translator of Ibsen, but just the idea of something written in a different style. Um, how would it change the scene? Well, I think really it's just different. Uh, it would it would be more of an emphasis on Nora's feminine disadvantages, the fact that she is a woman uh, and that she'll be treated as such um, according to the biases of her culture and her society. Uh, it also suggests more personal motives for Krogstad in that, you know, he seems a bit more vicious uh, in that he's really concerned, suggesting that he knows what she's going through um, and is uh, uh, thinking about that, um, yet disregarding it at the same time. Although that may also suggest that Krogstad has some understanding and perhaps even hidden sympathy for her. Uh, and so there's many other things that this might suggest. Again, perhaps Krogstad is, uh, it emphasizes the difference between him and the law and what he's doing and how even though he is uh, in some sense allied with the law or on the side of the law, he is misusing it. As when we talk about the um, spirit of the law versus the letter of the law, he's going by the letter and not the spirit. That perhaps could be an idea suggested by this rewriting. So think about uh, for yourself, how does the, how would changing this statement transform the meaning of the scene um, and yet still work within the play in a certain sense? Still work to communicate the main ideas and create the world that Ibsen is trying to create. So with that, um, I am going to say to be continued, I'll look at another example from later on in the play from Act 3, something that Nora says, and uh, a different kind of sentence, a different kind of statement, and go through the same process. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. You know how to do that. Um, and otherwise, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Have a great day.